Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Michael Madden. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. This is the first in a new series of videos where I'll be making a series of short films based on some of Australia's 101 Victoria Cross recipients based on my book, The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. I'll also be making a set of replica medals for each of these recipients. And if you stick around till after the video, I'll go through each medal and what they are and why they receive them. And I'll also probably make these available for purchase at the end as well to help support the video. Um, so please like and subscribe if you like this. Uh, the first video is a Victoria Cross recipient very near and dear to my heart, the tragic tale of Martin O'Meara, VC. I hope you enjoy it. Martin O'Meara was born in 1885 in Tipperary, Ireland to Michael and Margaret O'Meara. He came from a poor family and had a simple education. In 1912, he sailed to Australia and arrived in South Australia. By 1914, he had made his way to Western Australia, arriving in Collie, a coal and timber town two hours south of Perth. He soon gained employment as a tree feller and sleeper cutter. Martin's great niece, Noreen O'Meara says. My grandfather was Martin's older brother. I've always known about Martin. My father was named after him. Dad used to talk about Martin all the time. He was very proud of him. We all are. He was an extraordinarily brave man. On 19 August 1915, Martin enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force with several of his workmates. By December, he was sailing from Fremantle as a member of the 12th Reinforcements for the 16th Battalion. After training in Egypt in early 1916, Martin marched onto French soil as an infantryman. The 16th Battalion served in northern France near Fromelles before moving to the Somme. He joined the battalion scouting section where his roles could have included reconnaissance, sniping, intelligence gathering, and even kidnapping enemy soldiers for interrogation. A religious man, Martin had once spoken of his unwillingness to take lives. It was reported that he had hoped for a non-combatant role. He was sent into infantry, however, but obeyed his orders and carried out his duties faithfully. From all accounts, he was an outstanding infantryman. His service records are impeccable. In August 1916, the 16th Battalion mounted an attack on German positions at Mouquet Farm, near Pozier. In response, the Germans unleashed a devastating artillery strike on the Australians. An entry in the battalion war diary on 12 August stated that the trench as a trench had ceased to exist. The fighting around Pozieres and Mouquet Farm became the bloodiest and most costly Australia has ever been involved in. In less than seven weeks of battle, the Australians suffered over 23,000 casualties. It has been said that the poppies that grow there today sink their roots into soil, which has been soaked with more Australian blood than any other patch of dirt in the world. Over the dark days of 8 and 9 August, the Australian troops were fighting for their very existence. The artillery fell like dense hail, leaving no safe quarter for any man. Acting as a stretcher bearer, Martin ventured repeatedly into no man's land in appalling conditions and under continuous fire to try to bring in as many wounded men as he could. A seemingly impossible task given the insane level of shelling and gunfire. He carried every wounded man he could find back to the line where waiting medics treated their wounds. As the fighting and relentless shelling continued, the men at the front soon ran out of water and ammunition, making it but a matter of time until they were completely overrun. On his own initiative, Martin brought up supplies of grenades, ammunition, water and food, running through heavy bombardments and repeatedly exposing himself to lethal gunfire over and over again. He delivered the supplies right into a portion of the trenches which was being shelled the heaviest, allowing the Australians to survive and remain in the fight. The Allies were still under attack from artillery and machine gun fire by 12 August. Even after his battalion had been pulled out to rest, Martin remained in no man's land. 
Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Drake Brockman CMG DSOCB. I witnessed Omira return to the front line through heavy bombardment to rescue two wounded comrades. Omira continued in this vein until his luck ran out and he was wounded in the stomach by artillery shrapnel. Martin Omira officially saved the lives of more than 25 men. He was evacuated to England to recover, spending some time in hospital before returning to the front once more. One officer later described him as the most fearless and gallant soldier I have ever seen. Martin's Victoria Cross was gazetted on 8 September 1916, while he was recovering in England. He was visited by a childhood friend from his hometown, Mary Murphy. I heard the news that Martin had been hurt. It was, oh, such a shock and I wanted to see him. Martin seems to have harbored desires to marry Mary Murphy, who was now working as a nurse in England. While she visited him when he was recovering, the friendship was rekindled. By April 1917, Martin had recovered and was back on the Western Front. He fought at Bullecourt and was wounded at Messines village whilst manning a frontline trench. He was invited to Buckingham Palace on 21 July to be invested with his Victoria Cross by King George V. There is a video of Martin's investiture still available today. In that incredibly rare video, Martin is visible for only a few seconds but can be seen receiving his cross from the King. O'Meara saw his friend, Mary Murphy, that day and reportedly pinned his Victoria Cross on her uniform and they spent the remainder of the day together. Mary wore his cross all day. Martin O'Meara remained with the 16th Battalion on the Western Front and was promoted to sergeant when he was recalled to Australia in mid-1918. The government of the time had launched another recruitment campaign and had requested his help. Martin eventually agreed although was reluctant to leave his battalion. He sailed for Australia, but as fate would have it, he would never get the chance to return to England and win the hand of Mary Murphy. He arrived back in Fremantle on the 7th of November, 1918, but the real fighting had not yet begun for Martin O'Meara. This compassionate and courageous young man was about to embark on a journey into his own private hell, a darkness from which he would never emerge. Within a few short days of the armistice on the 11th of November, Martin suffered a complete mental breakdown. The armistice may have been the catalyst for this, but we will never know for sure. Perhaps it was the fact that his world had changed when he had least expected it. His beloved AIF would be no more, and it was at about this time that Martin discovered that Mary Murphy had married an Englishman. Whatever triggered his downfall seems to have occurred around mid-November that year whilst in quarantine. Martin had gone into quarantine expecting to be in Australia for only a short time. The plan had been to do some recruiting for the government and then go back to his battalion and hopefully catch up with Mary. Those plans were now in ruin. He was due to be released from the quarantine station on the 13th, but was far too unwell to be let go. Another possibility might have been that Martin felt trapped when the war ended. Politics were complicated in Ireland at the time the war ended. Irish men who had served with the British were often vilified due to the powerful anti-British sentiment engulfing that country. Martin had no family in Australia or England and may have felt he might be hated at home. After all, he had fought for and been awarded the highest decoration from Ireland's oldest enemy. Something inside him, it seems, must have just snapped in the most horrendous of ways. Martin O'Meara VC was transferred to the Army's Stromness Mental Hospital. They struggled to look after him there and had to bring people across from the Claremont Hospital for the insane to look after him. He was soon considered too radical for Stromness, so on the 3rd of January 1919, they moved him over to Claremont. He was reportedly hearing voices and suffering from delusional insanity. He was suicidal and extremely violent. He was such a powerful man. He would break out of his straitjacket almost every night during his first weeks at Claremont. It would take numerous staff members and sometimes other patients to restrain him. He was initially held in a straitjacket for up to 23 hours a day. Martin, it seemed, was paying a high price for the horrors and atrocities he had witnessed on the Western Front. Now permanently at the Claremont Hospital for the Insane, he would spend the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. A man once described as someone who wouldn't drink or even curse was now screaming obscenities and flying into brutal fits of rage. 
During one of these outbursts, Martin, determined to do himself harm but restrained by his straitjacket, bit off the tip of his own tongue. Locked away from fellow veterans who may have understood some of what was happening to Martin, his health deteriorated even further. He frequently required sedation at night to help him sleep. It was never clear if Martin's mental condition was solely a result of his war experiences, or if he already had some underlying psychological condition. The once powerful and courageous man, once regarded as the perfect soldier, was gone. Martin was a man who loved the outdoors. He wasn't used to being locked up inside, restrained and isolated. His decline continued. With no family in Australia, no one to visit him, and now trapped inside with his own nightmares, it was the perfect storm. In 1921, Martin's plight and that of the other returned servicemen at Claremont was noticed by those outside the hospital. The RSL became involved, and as a result of the RSL's concerns over the hospital's treatment of veterans, the Lemnos Veterans Hospital was built in nearby Mosman Park. Once transferred to Lemnos with his fellow veterans in late 1926, Martin received much better care. As a result, he slowly started to improve. Over the years, he recovered to the point where he could hold lucid conversations and was even known to dance Irish jigs for the entertainment of the other veterans. O'Meara even managed to attend an Anzac Day march in 1935, the only service he is known to have attended. He needed to be driven in a car at the front of the march with other veterans who could not walk due to their wounds. At this time, Martin was only 50 years old. Martin recovered enough to go out of the hospital with other patients from time to time. The damage to Martin's psyche was already done, however, and would never be fully undone. This brief period of relief would be short-lived. In November 1935, he relapsed and was readmitted to the Claremont Hospital for the insane. Martin was diagnosed with chronic mania and went into a frightful frenzy. He worked himself into such a state that he eventually died. The hospital stated that he had died of exhaustion brought on by chronic mania. He died on the 20th of December 1935, and his funeral was held on the 21st. He received a military funeral at Karakata Cemetery in Perth. It was a fitting funeral for one so brave. James Woods VC, Thomas Axford VC MM, and Clifford Sadlier VC were all in attendance, as well as many other notable dignitaries. Despite the impressive turnout for his funeral, the name Martin O'Meara VC soon fell off the radar completely. There were no streets, hospitals or parks named after him until years later, when care and consideration for the mentally unwell finally started to change. In 1986, Martin's Victoria Cross was donated to the Army Museum of Western Australia in Fremantle by the 16th Battalion. The battalion had been given the medal in the 1940s. Martin's great-niece, Noreen O'Meara still has Martin's World War I victory medal. Noreen says Martin's British War Medal, the only other medal he received, is lost within the family in the UK. The 16th Battalion named their boozer after him, and a plaque was laid for Martin in Collie, Western Australia, in 1990. In 2006, author and historian Ian Loftus released his book, The Most Fearless and Gallant Soldier I Have Ever Seen, Perth playwright Noel O'Neill has written a play called Under Any Old Gum Tree about Martin. There is a ward at the Hollywood Private Hospital in Netherlands, Western Australia, named after him. In 2013, a monument dedicated to Martin was erected in the village of Laura Village, Tipperary Island. In 2019, author Michael C. Madden made a replica set of Martin's medals. His father John and his brother Tony visited the school Martin used to attend in Tipperary and donated the medals along with a copy of Madden's book, The Victoria Cross, Australia Remembers. That same year, Martin's Victoria Cross was loaned to the Dublin Museum for one year. It remains the only Victoria Cross ever to go on public display in Ireland. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that, that video. I think you can see why uh, myself and everybody at TPI Victoria found this story so important. Um, what you just saw, there was a painting of Martin O'Meara by my friend 
uh, George Petru. It's a wonderful painting. Uh, we found this story so important. You'll see with the book, The Victoria Cross, Australia Remembers, there's a window in the front cover and you can see a Victoria Cross through the cover. Uh, we chose that very deliberately. Um, that's Martin's cross you can see through that window and being as the book was designed to raise money for totally and permanently incapacitated veterans and Martin's case was such a shocking one uh, we thought it was important that it'd be the first thing people see when they pick up the book uh, so that was very very deliberate and it's just a reminder that uh, if you are going through tough times you look at somebody like Martin uh, as perfect and powerful as he was he, he still fell um, to PTSD and the other uh, psychological illnesses people suffer. So please, if this uh, video has made you uncomfortable or upset in any way, please do do contact somebody, uh, whether it be TPI or uh, Beyond Blue or any other, other organisations to help you out. I'm going to talk a little bit now about Martin's three medals. He, he received three after the war. The first one here you can see is the Victory Medal. This was awarded to pretty much uh, all services, all, all people who served in the war. Um, it was uh, coined in uh, 1919 to commemorate uh, the Allied victory during the war. So basically anyone who participated in the military would have received this. Um, as you can see, this is the one that, um, that, that Noreen has. The one you see here is a replica, but you saw a picture in the, in the video that was actually Noreen's hands holding Martin's. This is the British War Medal that uh, has been lost. Martin's has been lost. Um, this one also was introduced in uh, 1919. And basically anybody who served within the military in the British Empire received this. Most Australian servicemen and women received these too. Sometimes you see what's mistakenly call, called the Gallipoli Star, um, the third one. Uh, that was for service overseas before the end of 1915. Most Australians didn't go until after that. This, of course, is the Victoria Cross, and you just saw... Uh, what Martin did to receive this. Um, it's obviously the, the Victoria Cross is the highest award for valor in the world. Um, that's a replica. What I've got there on the left, that's, this is actually a, a real one. It's sort of unissued, made by Hancock's uh, to commemorate uh, each Victoria Cross ever received. It's worth noting uh, the Victoria Cross, it, it's more than just a, a gallantry award. I think Jeremy Clarkson put it really well in one of his videos. He said that he illustrated it really well. He said that anyone who receives the Victoria Cross gets the post nominals VC after their name. And no matter what else you do in your life, you could be you could receive a Nobel Prize, you could be knighted. Nothing comes before VC, like a PhD, nothing. It is the highest award within the British Empire you can possibly receive. And there's so many wonderful facts about it. Um, of course, that uh, VCs are made from metal from a uh, captured gun. Um, they're actually Chinese cannons that were being used by the Russians that were captured. Uh, legend says during the Battle of Sebastopol, uh, they're actually nowhere near that. But uh, they, they are all made from that metal. Um, so it, it is a very, very unique medal. And another great tradition of it is that uh, anybody who receives the cross, everybody else within the military, uh, must salute them. Uh, just another, there's many, many traditions like that around the Victoria Cross, which are, which are very, very unique. So these, these are the three that Martin received. Um, the VC, his Victoria Cross was on display in Dublin. I believe it's now been returned to Australia, um, back to the uh, Fremantle Museum, uh, the Fremantle Ar Ar Army Museum. Uh, Noreen, as I said, has uh, the still has the Victory Medal. So I want to thank Noreen very much for her support, both making the book and making this video. Um, and the British War Medal, as far as I last heard, still remains lost. If you do, if you are interested in purchasing these, um, I'll put, make them available through my website. I'll leave a link down below. Uh, and money made from these, hopefully someone from the family buys these sets. I think that would be really lovely. Uh, money made from the sale of these will go back to funding the channel so I can keep making these videos. There's 101 Victoria Cross recipients from Australia. There's about to be 102. Uh, another one has been approved. We're just waiting for some politicians to get out of the way and um, and let it all go through. We're hoping that that happens soon. That'll get us to 102. So I'll do as many as I can. If there's any 
that you would like to see, any stories you'd like to see, preferably Australian Victoria Cross recipients. Um, if there's, if you've read my book and you've got any questions, uh, please let me know in the comments. And please do subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed this, and that will let me know that, that this is the sort of content people want and that I should continue doing it. And as I said, any suggestions, I can't guarantee I'll do it, because I do try and work with the family and make sure they're happy with what I'm doing. I know most of the families, but not all of them. So please, uh, leave a comment below and let me know if you want to see more of these videos. Thank you and we'll see you next time.